This is not gold. It's not silver, platinum, or anything you'd see in a jewelry store window today. It's aluminium, and 150 years ago, it was one of the most expensive materials on earth. Not because it looked good, not because it was rare, but because no one could figure out how to get it out of rock. In 1855, a small bar of aluminium was displayed at the Paris World Fair like it had fallen from space. People marveled at it. Newspapers called it silver from clay, and Emperor Napoleon III, he had a full set of aluminium cutlery made for his most distinguished guests. The less important ones, they had to make do with silver. Today, aluminium is wrapped around your takeaways, lines your kitchen drawers, and clutters your recycling bin in the form of crumpled cans. So how did a metal, once worth more than gold, become the most disposable substance in your house? This is a story about chemistry, politics, empire, and how a single discovery flipped the value of a metal overnight. Aluminium is everywhere. It's the most abundant metal in Earth's crust. But for most of human history, it was completely out of reach. You see, unlike gold or silver, aluminium doesn't exist in nature as a shiny nugget. It's trapped inside minerals like bauxite and alumina, chalky, unassuming stuff that doesn't exactly scream precious. Ancient civilizations have been using aluminium compounds for millennia without knowing it. Egyptians used alum to fix dyes and textiles, the Greeks used it to treat wounds. In medieval Europe, it was vital to the cloth trade. Alum became so valuable that wars were even fought over it. When vast reserves were found near Rome in the 15th century, a papal envoy declared it could supply all of Europe and bankrupt the Ottomans in the process. So for centuries, people worked with aluminium's ghost without ever meeting the metal itself. That changed in 1825, when Danish chemist Hans Christian Orsted finally isolated a tiny sample of aluminium just a speck from a chemical compound. A German chemist later refined the process, but it was still painfully inefficient. Imagine doing open heart surgery with oven gloves. The turning point came in the 1850s, when French chemist Henri Saint Clair de Ville developed a new method using sodium. Finally, you could produce small blobs of actual aluminium, not easily and not cheaply, but at least reliably, and that's where the emperor stepped in. Napoleon III, the emperor of the French, was obsessed with military innovation and national prestige and he saw aluminium as a futuristic miracle metal. Lightweight, strong, and silvery. He wanted it for weapons, armor, medals, and naturally, for showing off at royal banquets. He poured a lot of money into Deville's research. In 1855, aluminium was displayed at the Paris Exposition Universelle, and the public was entranced. One newspaper dubbed it the silver from clay. It looked like treasure, but it came from dirt. It was a fairy tale metal. But here's the thing. In the 1850s, aluminium was selling for around 80 pound a kilogram. That was the same price as gold at the time. There was just one problem, the Vaux's process was too slow. In 1869, total wool production was just about two metric tons. That's about the weight of a car. And by 1884, when the 2.8 kilogram aluminium capstone was placed atop the Washington Monument in the US, it was the single largest piece of aluminium ever made. At that moment, more aluminium sat on a single obelisk than in most countries. Despite all the hype, aluminium remained more scientific curiosity than industrial material. That is, until two teenagers on opposite sides of the Atlantic cracked the code. Charles Martin Hall had a knack for chemistry. In 1880, while studying at Oberlin College, he heard a lecture from his professor who said, whoever finds a way to make aluminium cheaply will not only bless humanity, he'll get rich. Hall later turned to a friend and said, I'm going for that metal. Meanwhile, in Normandy, Paul Harrow, the son of a leather tanner, had dropped out of mining school and was chasing the same dream. Both, working independently in 1886, stumbled upon the same solution, molten cryolite. This obscure mineral, when combined with aluminium oxide and subjected to an electric current, became the key to unlocking aluminium. Their near simultaneous discovery in 1886 would go down in history as the Hall Harrow process. It was simple, scalable, and revolutionary. Overnight, the economics changed. Aluminium production skyrocketed, and prices plummeted, from hundreds of pounds per kilo to just pennies. By the 1890s, aluminium had left the ballroom and entered the factory floor. From that moment on, aluminium reshaped the world. It was light, strong, and didn't rust, perfect for industry. The Wright brothers used aluminium alloy in their first engine. The Soviets relied on it for tanks and planes in World War II. NASA used it for the Apollo missions. In Britain, during the Blitz, people donated their aluminium pots and pans to the war effort. By the 1950s, aluminium was everywhere. Kitchen foil, aeroplanes, ladders, window frames, it had gone from royal novelty to domestic necessity. The irony? Aluminium didn't get any rarer, we just got better at accessing it. So why was aluminium once more valuable than gold, and why isn't it anymore? Because value isn't just about rarity, it's about access. Gold has always been rare. Aluminium was just locked away, until someone found the key. What's really fascinating isn't the metal, it's us. How we assign worth, 
how we attach status to scarcity, how the meaning of material can be undone in an instant by a clever teenager with a bit of electricity. So next time you crack open a can, remember, you're holding what was once the crown jewel of French imperial ambition, a metal so valuable it sat on thrones, whereas now it sits in your recycling bin. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.